and welcome to another video segment here at Waiting for Next Year. This week I have a very special guest, uh, former editor of Fear the Sword and uh, one of the best Cavs minds on the internet and all around swell fella, David Zabak, uh, coming to us live from Toledo. David, hello. Hey, what's going on? I'm very excited that you're on. One of my favorite people in the whole world. Um, one of the most recognizable Cavs fans on the interwebs, um, obviously from Fear the Sword, but also on, on the Twitters as well. So thank you for joining. Um, I know that you've been a big Kyrie fan uh, you know, since he's been here. Um, digesting the trade has not been a, one of the more fun things we've had to do over the last couple of days, but now that it's been 24 hours or so, uh, you know, how do you feel about the Cavs specifically this year? Uh, do you think that we, you know, is it a significant downgrade? Do you think that we've improved? Is it a, a kind of a neutral move? You know, how do you feel just specifically for the 2017, 2018 season? And it's like a cop out, but it's like all what LeBron James like wants to do, at least in terms of the regular season, right? So there's like all these reports that he's like working out on like an obsessive level. Um, and I think there'll be some urgency in terms of um, apparently it wasn't like that great of a relationship, but like Kyrie and LeBron didn't have to figure out how to coexist last year right so they could win 50 games or 49 games and get the second or third seed and they still knew that when the playoffs came they had roles and they were ready to go do what they could to fill them and it worked out really well two years ago this year not quite as well but there wasn't some sort of driving force motivating them in the regular season and I think uh, with Isaiah Thomas, there will be that urgency um, with him and LeBron where they have to feel each other out and they have to exert themselves a little bit in the regular season. Um, and I think that will lead to more wins, and I think it will lead to a more interesting um, regular season. Um, you know, I've, I've seen people say, you know, this is really good in terms of the Cavs' depth, um, in terms of behind LeBron James with with Jay Crowder, and I think that's true. I think I, I think um, I'm not entirely sure that I am confident enough in Jay's jump shot in terms of what it's going to look like in the playoffs, but in terms of the regular season, him playing 25 minutes a game hopefully allowing LeBron to sit a little bit more. I think that's a, that's, that's a really nice piece that they were able to add to. So um, I think their ceiling is lower. Um, I don't think that they're as good of a May and June team. Um, and that sort of has to do with how I feel about Isaiah. But um, I think they're a better regular season team. And I think it'll be a more interesting regular season in terms of like, turning it on on a nightly basis and um and now we get to like look at the draft too i guess so um i think in terms of like uh things for people to write about and things for people to follow this was a huge upgrade <laughs> um but isaiah thomas is like five foot eight and <laughs> um you know steph curry is six three or six four and can shoot over him and sean livingston is six seven um and i just i think i think isaiah thomas i think the Cavs have given him a hard time the last couple of years um and i think I, I i'm i'm worried about his um ability to, to defend in the playoffs so we'll see what about you yeah i definitely think the regular season is going to be more fun. Um, there is going to be a little bit more urgency. Last year was kind of awful in the regular season. I mean, I know we won a lot of games, but they just it didn't seem like the team. I don't want to say they didn't care because that's like a loaded word, but it, it they just didn't seem to have much to prove or much to work out, or or you know things weren't all that confusing. Um, so I do think that you know Isaiah Thomas is not only trying to work into a new team, he's trying to work for a max deal, um, and he's going to be on a team where he's not going to be the the main guy like he was in Boston. So that's going to be a little bit harder for him. Um, I, I, I'm very excited for like the LeBron revenge tour. It's kind of like, you know, that Brooklyn picks exciting. We get to watch that all year, but it's, you know, the LeBron, is he going to try to win another MVP thing is 
maybe the most fun storyline of the whole regular season. I wonder, if, like, I wonder if he kind of like watched Russell Westbrook and like kind of feels like he learned the cheat code. Like he doesn't necessarily have to play 110% every night. He just has to get these triple doubles. So I feel like I feel like I wonder if you see LeBron like try and like maybe not average a triple double, but kind of go the Russell Westbrook route and start hunting rebounds and um you know I could see a nine a nine year from LeBron where he's getting like sixty triple doubles or something and um and and he just because because LeBron's kind of the guy who like kind of would try and game the system like that. I feel like oh, yeah. you'd find an easy way to get the MVP real quick. <laughs> yeah, like um, so I, I think you could see that. I think I think he would like one more. I think something's driving him, whether it's Kyrie being an idiot or losing in five games or some combination of those. Um, I think the combination of LeBron trying to do that and you know one last run at MVP and kind of showing up Kyrie, all that kind of stuff. Coupled with Isaiah Thomas being used to being a high usage guy, um, also working for a max deal. Like Kevin Love might not even average six points this year. Like they just might not even pass to him at all. I'm just thinking about this. I know we're not talking about this, but like, like the king of like the tryhards, like they, they win all these regular season games by just like caring it's gonna be like a pretty big culture shock for Kyrie, right? Like, like kind of freestyle, you know, my turn, your turn with LeBron to Brad Stevens and this culture of like Marcus Smart, right? Like, because like he's gonna get guarded by Marcus Smart. Like he probably like this last year without Delhi was probably like the best practices Kyrie has ever had. And now he's going to have to go back to, like, dealing with Marcus Smart. So. All right, well, I know we were going to talk about the Cavs, but I kind of do want to talk a little bit about Kyrie and Boston because they've kind of unloaded all of those try-hard guys. I mean, that roster's That's true too. doesn't have any of those guys. And so now they're adding Hayward, they're adding Kyrie. I know everybody praises Brad Stevens' system and all this stuff, but he's always kind of had almost like a college team, just a bunch of, like you said, try-hard guys that you know follow the system. I am really interested to see how Kyrie and Brad Stevens coexist in this idea of sharing the ball and running all this stuff and give the ball up, get it back kind of stuff. That's not Kyrie's game. And I don't know that it should be Kyrie's game. I mean, you've kind of driven the point home and and I'm a believer in it at this point that Kyrie goes ISO because he's really good at doing that. And he scores at a really efficient rate. Um, And is Brad Stevens going to put up with that? Can he change his system to maximize Kyrie or, you know, what we saw from Isaiah Thomas this year was his best season ever. Do you know, do you expect that from Kyrie? Do you think Steven gets the most, Stevens gets the most out of him? Maybe like, I, I mean, I'm curious to see how Kyrie's, you know, knee holds up, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm curious because Isaiah Thomas had a huge workload all year. You know, does, does Kyrie want to do that? Maybe he does. Um, be fascinating i would say you know isaiah thomas operated with a lot of freedom and i I think Kyrie will have that Um, but it will be sort of curious to see does he go from six assists a game to eight or eight and a half right um because he's not sharing ball handling duties with lebron now it's gordon hayward and gordon's great but he's not lebron right so um, yeah, where Kyrie's game goes is fascinating, and um, I think he'll trust Stevens early on. I'll give a shout out to their uh, assistant head coach, Jay Laranega, because he went to my high school and and all of that. Um, I think he'll be a NBA head coach within the next couple of years. So the two of them, I think, are are well equipped to reach Kyrie um, and get him to buy in. Um, but you know, it's, it's weird. I, my thing with them is they just have to find a way to rebound. Like where, I, I don't know where they, I don't know where they're going to get the rebounders. So they have Jalen Brown and, uh, and Horford, you know, I don't know what you can get for that, but, um, you know, it's, it'll be, it'll be interesting. They're a really good team. Um, 
I don't know how much better they are now than they were last year without a few more moves. Now, I, I do think they have younger and more high upside players than they did three months ago. So I'm not trying to be really negative about it because I can't say, well, my thing is go collect stars and then really complain when Boston just got two in one offseason. I think that's really good. Um, and I think, I think Hayward and, and Kyrie should complement each other fairly well. But then you have to, to find a way to, to put pieces around it. Um, yeah, they also have to find a way to defend. I, you know, I think losing Crowder and Bradley and just a lot of that depth, uh, I, it's, you know, it, I, it's hard to see how they're going to defend anybody really at a high level. And that was kind of their identity last year. I mean, as far as I understood it, you know, they, they were a pretty good defensive team or really good defensive team. And they let Isaiah Thomas score a bunch. But – they're going to be losing part of that. And Kyrie, I think, is better than Isaiah Thomas. I mean, I know statistically Thomas had a little bit better year, but I, I think, you know, top end Kyrie, his potential is to be even better. But without that defense anchoring all that, it's going to be interesting how it goes. They still have a ton of talent, so it'll still be good. But let's shift it back to the Cavs. Um, you touched on this. Uh, Thomas in the playoffs. I, I kind of wrote him off this year going into the playoffs. I just didn't think – that at his height, he'd be able to do much, but I, I, he did pretty damn well. I mean, he scored at a high clip, uh, but he did get exposed defensively. How, what do you expect from him? I mean, I, do you think it'll be a problem in the East at all? It, it seems like we should be able to walk through that pretty well. I'm, I'm not that scared of Boston, but I mean, is he, yeah. how much of a bigger problem is he versus Golden State, is his defense versus Golden State than Kyrie's? I think it's a big problem. Um, I, I will say, without going back too much to Boston, I just I'll say, as of right now, Boston's construction is not scary to me. I, I do they do they still have some pieces to try and make it work? Yes, um, but no, I don't see anybody in the East that's a real problem. However, um, I do think you'll see some teams that are able to um, poke holes and, and sort of hint at things that will be problematic down the road. Um, and I, I, I do think Isaiah's height is going to be a huge problem against the Warriors. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where Golden State might be reluctant to attack mismatches. They got a lot more ruthless, ruthless at it this year than they were a year ago. Um, but you know, these are NBA players shooting over a five foot eight guy is just not difficult for most of these guys. And, um, you know, when the Warriors are six, seven, six, eight, six, eight, six, seven, um, you know, they started to trust Draymond a little bit more to play some bully ball on Kyrie this year than they had the year before. Now it's on Isaiah Thomas. Um, is it more than a few points a game? I don't know, but you don't really have very many to spare when you're playing the Warriors. So yeah, we were already in negative points. We, we yeah, were yeah. <laughs> yeah, the margin for error is very small, and um, so yeah. I mean, again, I think Isaiah might be a better regular season player than Kyrie, um, but in terms of you know. Uh, I think in terms of defense, it's crazy, but but Kyrie just has more upside and is better. Yeah, and Kyrie didn't play a lot of great defense, but he could in spurts play really good defense. And I don't know that at his height you can even expect that from Thomas, which is going to be a problem. You know, I mean, even if – I'm just throwing percentages out. Even if Kyrie was a 20%, you know, good – percentage of defense, I, I don't think you can even expect that from Thomas. So that's going to be tough. Uh, does Crowder change the math for you at all? It's another body to throw at a Durant or a Draymond or something. It, it's pretty flexible in terms of position. So, you know, we experimented with LeBron at center, you know, Crowder opens up some things like that, or, or even just playing the four, kind of playing that Shane Battier role or something. You know, does he change the math for you at all, specifically in a Warriors matchup? Yeah, I, I was like pretty negative about it. Yesterday, I'm sort of opening up to it. Um, that, you know, the homer in me has sort of pointed to over and over over the last two months is Kyle Korver shoots 24% from three in the NBA Finals. Andre Iguodala shoots like 
49% from three in the NBA Finals, right? Um, there's a 35% career three-point shooter. Now, uh, Kevin Hetrick is crazy and found his last 750 attempts. He's a 37% shooter. So pretty decent three-point shooter, right? But the samples get so small over a four- to seven-game series. A good couple games, and he's defending like he can. And be um, – in the league of of what Andre Iguodala was able to do for for the Warriors in June, right? So, um, is it likely that Jay Crowder is a fifty percent three point shooter next June? No, but it wasn't likely that Andre Iguodala would either. And it's it's another guy with the ability to do something like that, which. If you're going to beat the Warriors, you need some guys to shoot over your percentages and still defend. And so, um, is the LeBron bump still a thing? Yeah, I was thinking about that as you were talking about him being a 35% career guy. You know, we used to always say, oh, he's a 35%, but when you play with LeBron, you get an automatic 2 or 3% on your three point. I, is that still a thing? We've cycled through, through many guys, so many guys at this point. And it seems like it works for some and doesn't for others. Do you think it, it's, it's a thing that we can say uh, with any sort of authority about this? It should be a thing, but, like, one of the things that I think people missed the boat on with this Kyrie-LeBron thing is, like, and, and, and it, people sort of self-corrected on this, but when the Kyrie wants out thing first happened, everyone was like, play with LeBron. And it's like, actually, like, this dude just, like, subtweets people, like, all year long and um, like 7 a.m. And if you don't, if you're not there, you get subtweeted. And um, Can I make it clear that I think being a LeBron, LeBron all day would be just awful? He's, like, a big person. Yeah. Like, it's just got to be awful. Yeah, like, he'll, I'm, like, he just takes games off. And, like, sometimes he takes them off by not playing and sometimes he takes them off by playing, but not playing. Right. So um, now is it worth it to play with LeBron? Yes. You go to the finals every year. I'm not saying that, but I think you can look at, at, at a Mike Dunlavy for him last summer. He actually ended up playing pretty well for the Hawks. He wasn't hundred percent done, but he did not like playing with LeBron James. Um, That's to me like, always going to be one of those moves that like, we always talk in sports about you know, outcomes, but like the process on that, like Mike Dunleavy should have made a ton of sense on that Cavs team. Like him not working great. out, him not working out was not like someone's fault. Like that just, that the math just, it, it completely made sense in every way. Except the glare, the, the, the glares that LeBron would give him when he wasn't in the right place and the barking that LeBron would do in practice got to him. Mm-hmm. It did. So um, I know Jay Crowder seems like a pretty tough guy. I don't think he's going to wither away from LeBron. So I would hope so. Um, but people are different. So we'll see. All right, I know that you're not super excited about this part of it, but I mean, it's probably the biggest part of the trade. The Brooklyn pick, are you trying to flip that tomorrow and, and find the next guy to add? Uh, to this team, or are you holding on to it for a while and, and maybe trying to use it in the offseason? I like how I, none of the options were just drafting a guy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, if LeBron is really leaving, I think you have to hold on to it. And then you've got this and, on, on teach, Antich, on, on teach. Ante Zizic? I don't know if that's right. That's all I'm saying. Chetty, Chetty, Chetty Osman and whatever – uh, Euro guy, everybody's all about. It's like the Bagley, and then uh, so if LeBron's not going to commit, I think you have to hold on to it. So that, that was going to uh, be my question. Guy like him, what, what do you mean? No, my question was going to be do you go to LeBron at the deadline and say, hey, we could go get, I'm just throwing out names, you know, Boogie Cousins or Marcus Saul or, or Paul George, and you know, we need you to say your stat. He's not going to answer. And if he doesn't answer, you, you, you don't make the trade, right? No, I, I would not. 
at that point, you have to hold on to it, and you're playing for three years from now. That's good. What a and you, and, and you better not pay. Well, then you have to think about at $150 million and what makes sense there because letting stars walk and getting nothing back is not good. But paying a 30 year old five foot eight point guard $150 million over five years doesn't sound like fun to me either. So I do wonder, I, I, two things. I don't actually, I mean, we saw his value in this trade. He, he had a better season than Kyrie. I'm not saying he's a better player. I mean, obviously, with Kyrie's age, his upside, his contract, his playoff acumen, he's a better player. But I, I don't think the gap is massive. And Thomas was part of a throw-in that included the Brooklyn pick and Crowder and Zizit. I mean, that's obviously his value around the league. And he's going to be coming into a situation where he's not going to be the only guy trying to score. Um, so his numbers are probably going to dip. I mean, we saw George Hill barely get a contract this year. I just wonder what he's really going to get next offseason. So I, That's, yeah. I, I, I do wonder about that. I, honestly, but my other point was just, if he walks, I don't even know if it's that huge of a deal. If you are able to either use the Brooklyn pick to flip for another big time guy or draft a really good upcoming player, I just, I don't know that I'm that worried about Thomas leaving at that point. Maybe that's crazy. But if, I feel it's, like, if it's Paul George or Anthony Davis, see you later, Brooklyn pick. Mm-hmm. If it's Boogie Cousins, no. Yeah, you, you got to hold on to it. So I think it's a case-by-case basis. Um, but you do have to realize that if you hold on to that Brooklyn pick, you're not getting actual contribution to basketball wins. It's 2017 right now. Uh, there will probably be another administration in the White House by the time that that <laughs> player is, is helping you win basketball games. All right, uh, last question. Current point guard depth is Isaiah Thomas, Derrick Rose, Jose Calderon. How many points do you think you could score as an opposing point guard against the Cavs next season? My CYO team in eighth grade went undefeated, and I was the starting point guard. So let's start with that. Uh, We were in the D League, or maybe even the E League, so it wasn't very uh, impressive. Uh, zero. However, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> um, uh, they're, they're like collecting these dudes that I don't like to play point guard. Um, yeah, there's a certain amount of it where like they're not good players, but also I don't want to also have to cheer for a lot of these guys. Like I spent a yeah, lot of time um, mocking them. I think I did. I think I was like the only person on Twitter that like didn't freak out when there were called around rumors last year. Like, I was just kind of like, all right, like, he can just shoot threes off the bench and, like, catch LeBron passes. And that didn't really, like, bother me that much. So, I don't know. I I made, like, one comment about Calderon to a Cavs employee, and, like, he got really mad at me. Like, just talking about the limited resources that the team has and – you know, I think people are, are maybe a little bit more negative on Calderon than maybe need to be. That being said, Derek Rose, I, I, that's a Dan Gilbert signing. I mean, if you think about when that signing went down, you think about um, what that involved. I just, I just don't see a basketball reason for it. I just don't want to have to cheer for that man. I just despite my least favorite NBA player uh, in the league. But anyway, all right. Well, thank you, Zavak, very much for coming on. I appreciate it. I think we've covered uh, pretty much everything from this trade. I'm going to bug you to come on again later in the year. Maybe we'll talk Browns. Maybe we'll talk Cavs. I want to talk uh, Deshaun Kaiser. Bernie Kaiser. I just I refuse to call him anything but Bernie Kaiser. It's too, it's too perfect. Deshaun Kaiser. He's going to be a legend in, in that town. He's already a legend in this town. It's going to be a legend in the <laughs> I like that. I like that. They'll just have a statue that'll just go across the turnpike every week. They'll, they'll switch it back. They'll be like pointing at each other. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> like, like the Sistine Chapel. Like, he'll have his own. <laughs> Kaiser, Kaiser, like, bridging the. Yeah, yes. I, I'm, I'm in. I'm in for this. 
All right. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on again. This is Waiting for Next Year. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in, and we will see you next time. See you later.